Now we're going to turn a little bit in looking at advancing social and economic mobility across the African continent. This session is in partnership with the Global Citizen Forum. And as a longtime programming partner of Concordia's, the Global Citizen Forum plays a vital role in ensuring a more interconnected world. We are delighted to work with the Global Citizen Forum to promote important conversations on economic resilience, mobility, the role of innovative financing and ushering in socioeconomic impact and more on a global level. To get involved with the Global Citizen Forum, please do check out the newsfeed on the main event page for opportunities to tap into GCF's innovative platform. You can also check out the sponsor and partner tab that I mentioned earlier. And with that, I am very pleased to welcome back to Concordia, um, Armand Arten, a good friend and supporter of Concordia, president and CEO of Arten Capital and the founder of Global Citizen Forum, as well as James Ireland, senior advisor of Covington and Burling, Ivan Manzi Makolo, Chief Executive Officer of Rwanda Air, and Zephanie Nayonkuru, Deputy CEO of Rwanda Development Board. Armand, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having me. And it's always a pleasure to be part of the Concordia family and Concordia experience. Even digital, your reach out um, around the world is uh, phenomenal and we're very happy to, to partner with you on, on this topic. Welcome to my colleagues on this panel. Um, um, again, a short introduction about the Global Citizen Forum and Arts and Capital. Over the last 10 years, uh, we have created the nonprofit arm of Arts and Capital called the Global Citizen Forum in order to really focus on um, impacting the world's uh, benefit from human mobility. Everything from migration to security to improving trade and economic and social development that comes, as well as security challenges, migrations and refugees. So we're very excited to have you on this panel because we believe that uh, the African continent is um, about to implement a very important uh, element uh, in terms of mobility. This is the African Union Passport Initiative uh, launched uh, about five years ago, uh, hasn't yet rolled out um, as expected and as soon as expected. But um, I think that the positive uh, elements of what this could mean for trade, for economic developments, um, air travel are, are phenomenal. So um, again, I would like to start with uh, uh, Jay, with Mr. Ireland, to uh, over many decades of experience in Africa. Um, I think you are very well positioned to tell us um, the barriers of freedom of movement, how this impacts uh, foreign investments um, in Africa. And is it easier to do business in this country? continent compared to other, uh, considering all the visa restrictions that exist and that many African countries don't have embassies around the world and still don't have an e-visa system, which implies a very uh, hard to get uh, process, uh, which stops business development. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Armin. <clears throat> uh, good to see everybody. Um, I guess, you know, as I look at my time when I in, in Africa running uh, General Electric, um, the movement of people and goods was very difficult. And we're gonna to continue to see that going forward for two, a couple of reasons. One is the soft movement, which is mostly people, but then the other one is hard goods, et cetera. Uh, that really relies on good infrastructure, uh, which, you know, when you look at rail, roads, et cetera, railroads as well as roads and highways, that still needs a lot of uh, investment and a lot of uh, uh, continued improvement. Along with that is you have on, on goods uh, a lot of friction at borders, even with open borders in the EAC, as an example, um, there's still a lot of friction at each one of the borders. This is all pre-COVID, obviously. COVID presented a whole nother uh, issue. But I think the aspect of also tied into, um, and Yvonne, it'll be interesting to hear her thoughts, but air travel as well. You know, there aren't the airport, depending on countries and trying to travel around, there aren't that many flights available uh, to really go inter intercontinental. Uh, and that's continued to improve, but uh, still is, is an issue. From a people standpoint, um, the visas are, are uh, somewhat problematic. Um, more from the standpoint of can you get as a business person more than a one trip visa? Can you get a multiple year? Can you do things so it's easy to go back and forth, do meetings, et cetera? Most countries have that. 
um, but it has been uh, difficult to get and all. I can't, it's hard as an American to sit there and complain about visa processes for anybody else. Um, so I'm not there doing that, that's for sure. But um, <clears throat> I think the aspect of within Africa, having the ability for business people to really train, utilizing, especially now the air, airline networks, to really travel around the continent is key. And I think the one thing that for, from my perspective that we did a lot of is we transferred a lot of our, our people between countries. So we would have, you know, we were headquartered in, in uh, Kenya, uh, but we had big operations in South Africa, Nigeria, Angola, et cetera. And, and I wanted to transfer people to get different experiences. And if, I, if somebody that was Kenyan was going to go work in South Africa, they fundamentally gave up their passport for almost six months while the work, while the work visa was being processed. That person, that executive then couldn't travel was stuck in, and now we're used to this with Zoom, et cetera, COVID, but back then we weren't. And I think that's some of the things that we need to think about is how how can we how can we make this system a lot easier for, for businesses that do want to promote trade, that do want to promote continued growth and really drive economic change. So it's it's slowly improving. Um, <clears throat> and I think again another another aspect that I've heard from um, a, a friend and an executive, Aliko Dangote, says he needs, as a Nigerian, fundamentally to get more visas than I did as an American. And so within Africa, whether this AU passport pro process works, is, will be absolutely key as well. Because I think it's, it's, again, it's making sure that you can be mobile across the continent as you continue to drive business. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Indeed. Um, we have a tool called the Passport Index, which actually measures uh, the mobility of each passport and the passport around the world. Um, and unfortunately, the U.S. passport, as you know, in, in, in a post-COVID, uh, hasn't performed very well. It has about 40% of its mobility. Of course, this is temporary, and it doesn't reflect the visa-free agreements between countries, which are the normal standards, you know, IATA and ICAO. Uh, measures of mobility between uh, countries. Um, but to get back to some of, of your comments, you're absolutely right. I think that uh, the, the moving from physical visa to e-visa and digital visa, which will not allow uh, and require somebody to be stuck six months, as you mentioned, because his passport is in process, but will speed up the whole um, administration of mobility and, and issuance of e-visas that will spur um, the, the, the mobility in, in the continent. Uh, Mr. Nyonkuro, if um, you can tell us more a little bit about this initiative of Passport Index um, and how this plays into the conversation of development um, of Rwanda Bank as well as African Development Bank. Both entities have said in the past when this was launched that uh, this will have uh, enormous economic impact on the continent. Um, tell us a little bit more. What do you think about it? You're on mute. Uh, Mr. Nick, you're on mute, yeah. Thank you very much. As yeah. we talk about uh, the mobility um, across Africa, it's very important that uh, people be able to travel with ease and also not spend um, you know, more resources and time requesting for visas and so on. So as you actually mentioned, uh, the, the, the AU passport was, uh, was launched. Um, that was in, um, back in 2016. But of course, it hasn't um, 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 reached to so many people, and uh, it hasn't really uh, showed some of uh, the you know, positive profits or the benefits that were uh, expected. But again, it's getting there. As, uh, as, um, as Jay mentioned, there have been really quite a number of difficulties in terms of uh, an African or someone who is in one country moving to the other. In some cases, you may need to move to, from country A to country C, but you have to go to country B first of all to get the visa, which will take you to country C. So with the, with the, the passport that has been uh, um, um, introduced uh, and also taking it into the context of uh, the free continental trade agreement that has been signed, though of course there have been some sort of delays in terms of the actual implementation due to COVID, we believe that this will really be um, some of the key ingredients that will be um, um, having an add-on in terms of the intra 
Africa trade activities. If you look into uh, the state of uh, the trade activities in Africa, you really have uh, uh, Africa doing a lot of transactions with the rest of the world considered to what is done with the countries in Africa themselves. So we believe that as the people are able to move freely, that's number one, and uh, two, as they are able also uh, to benefit from initiatives like uh, Africa Free Trade Agreement, they be able to open business overseas, internationals be able to expand it to other countries, and also benefit from uh, some of the agreements that are being signed, like double taxation agreements, uh, uh, which really will be helping investors not to pay twice. So that's why I, I consider the passport as one of, our, of the initiatives that will um, uh, keep boosting movement of people, which again have uh, positive repercussions on trade and investment activities. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Madam Makolo, uh, as a CEO of Rwanda Air, um, I guess you, you are an expert uh, more than all of us in terms of uh, mobility and um, how do you see the, the, uh, the world in a post-COVID um, area where um, normal travel will return? Um, how much do you think that uh, the average consumer's mobility uh, is correlated with economic development. I mean, your country, for example, Rwanda has uh, on the passport index uh, um, open a score 198, which means that you're open, everybody can enter your country without visa. There is a clear correlation with maybe development of the country and openness in terms of uh, access. Uh, how this translates into um, mobility in, and, and travel there? Uh, thank you, Alma. Um, well, uh, to begin with, uh, speaking from the aviation on, on the aviation side, uh, the, the the current pandemic definitely has taken us several ste steps back. Uh, it was uh, Africa as a continent was greatly underserved. Jay has mentioned how difficult uh, it, it is to travel within the continent. Uh, with with the COVID now, a lot of airlines have have shrunk their networks as well. So it's become a, a bigger challenge to move from point A to point B. But the positive part is that uh, being underserved uh, and given the size of the continent, 1.2 billion people, um, and the fact that aviation really is the solution uh, in terms of mobility of all end goods with, with, within the continent. However, the, the number of uh, challenges which need to be addressed for, for it to be fully uh, maximized. Uh, a lot has been said about the, the visa regimes in different countries. You mentioned Rwanda. <laughs> Uh, being open, uh, which is also helping uh, the, the economic development of, of the country. We can see uh, pre-COVID um, uh, how, how uh, tourism has grown within the country, uh, conference tourism as well, um, the growth of the horticultural sector, uh, since it's much easier now uh, to, to transport uh, exports out of the country and bring imports into the country. So aviation has played a, a really uh, important role in terms of uh, the, the economic development of the country, and it's a strategic pillar of that. But in order for all the, all the other African countries to really benefit as well, a number of challenges have to be addressed. In addition to the visa regime, uh, we need to the high costs of doing uh, of, of operating airlines within the African continent. Uh, the high taxes, especially uh, aviation, is still seen as a luxury uh, where uh, some countries can can really maximize on the ta on the taxes, which makes the the, the tickets ticket prices shoot up. Um, we also have uh, a, a number of. Um, challenges in terms of infrastructure especially airports in different uh, in different african countries which which need to be to be worked on as well um but i believe that all these once all these challenges are addressed and it makes it easier for 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 africans to move from point a to point b without or point a to point c without going through point b as Stephanie mentioned uh, we'll really see uh, the continent uh, opening up economically, and especially with the with the implementation of the African uh, CFTA. Uh, so th there is a lot of potential. There's, there's still a, um, a lot of hope uh, to get through this uh, challenging uh, of COVID. Um, hopefully, in the next uh, year or two years, uh, we'll see the, the full potential of uh, mobility within within the, the continent. 
Thank you, Ivan. I appreciate it. And I, I agree with you that in the long term, uh, the prosperity of the continent um, depends on the mobility, intra-Africa and external as well. Um, some of the, and that's a question open to all of you, um, some of the skeptics on, on the African Union passport are evoking, of course, security issues that exist with, you know, opening the borders completely. Um, what is your opinion on that? Compare the positive impact in terms of trade and economic development versus security risk. Which one is more important to the future of the African continent? Well, um, I, 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 can, I, I think the, um, the question of, uh, of security is something that can be managed, whether it's investing in uh, advanced passenger information, so where you're able to, to get all the details of the passengers before or the people before they arrive in the country, and you're able to, to mitigate any, any risks that may arise. But I, I think the, the 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 positive part just opening up the country uh, to, to people and goods uh, but moving in freely that really overrides the security issue which as i mentioned can be managed and we've seen that we've seen that in rwanda opening up uh, completely uh, security it's one of the safest countries uh, in the world i would say thank you jay well, I think, you know, I always have to balance that, uh, the security versus open borders. But I think within a, you know, if you have, um, if you will, levels that you would allow um, people to come through or, or goods, et cetera. And I think that can be managed as, as Yvonne said, uh, you know, the, the systems today from a standpoint of tracking and understand and, and understanding who is traveling, et cetera, is, is very uh very well advanced and continuing to become more and more and more advanced. Um, so I think the aspect of of shutting the borders does inhibit trade and tr and inhibit um, basically that country to be able to grow because you need it both ways, whether you're exporting or importing. And I think that's the uh, whether it's people or goods. And I think that continued um, <clears throat> This continued traction between of, of both is absolutely key. So I think it's a balance. I think it can be managed, as Yvonne said, but the countries have to invest in that kind of infrastructure similar to what Rwanda has done. And I would say not everyone has done that yet. So that's part of the part of the issue. Thank you. And Stephanie, any final comments on what do you believe the private sector sees the same benefits as the governments of, of this initiative? Yeah, correct. The private sector um, sees that the benefits of this particular initiative. And, uh, from public sector point of view, first of all, it comes back to the leadership of the, private, of the public sector to lead the implementation of all of these good initiatives. Because, as you know, there have been other good initiatives, uh, you know, or other commercial and or regional blocks that are you know, operational. If you come to East Africa, you have, for example, the East Africa community. The other parts of Africa have Sadek, we have Comesa, and so on. But it comes back to the leadership of individual countries in terms of adhering to the principles or to what is able to happen. So that's number one. Number two, the private sector definitely, you know, we benefit from these uh, kind of initiatives. Um, if you look into some of the promotion activities that we are involved in every time, some of the key things that investors look at is if I do business, say, say in Rwanda, and I want to export, you know, how is it easy for me to export? How is it easy for me to do the trading activities across borders? Or if I have, let's say, a company that is based in Job or Nairobi, and I want to expand it to other countries, you know, how will I be able not only um, to repatriate capital when I need to be, or if I'm doing my consolidated financial statements or reporting, how do I make sure that, uh, you know, it becomes easier for me? So all of these initiatives will benefit the members of the private sector, and they will really help uh, multinationals to expand across several countries, uh, you know, across Africa, which will, again, help us to reach what INEC has been projecting when uh, this uh, pre um trade agreement was signed, where it was projected that actually this would even lead to intra-Africa trade being able to grow by 52%. You know, one of the things that was an interesting to to Zephanie's point is uh, we had a program with Carnegie Mellon 
University in Rwanda, where we, um, you know, they had students there and we wanted to do internships for those students during uh, summer breaks, et cetera. And we had trouble getting- the um, Are you in the mix? Uh, no, I'm we not. Can't hear you. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. we can hear you well. We had, a, we, had a program, we had a program with Carnegie Mellon University in Rwanda. And uh, part of that was to, we would provide internships for them, uh, for the students uh, for a period of time across some of our, the countries we operated in. And we had a hard time getting those students the ability to, to basically do an internship because of the visa, you know, again, the, the requirements that were by country. And again, this was a training, kind of a training uh, capability that we were providing. Again, and it wasn't all Rwandan students, it was Kenyan students in Rwanda, et cetera. So it all depended. And I think that those are the kind of things, building that base uh, will be important to really continue to drive to drive uh, employment for, for youth and, uh, and economic growth. Thank you, Jay. Um, indeed, I, we believe as well at, at the Global Citizen Forum and Art and Capital that whether it is the migration of, of humans or the migration of ideas, the mobility has the power to really spark innovation to uncover immense uh, potential and facilitate the adaptation in order to face the challenges that we're facing today. And the future of the African continent, I believe, really goes through this initiative, which we believe that 2021 will really start rolling over beside the diplomats to reach out the, 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 the citizens, the ordinary uh, passport holders. And we hope to, in the next 10 years to see that impact. Um, thank you, everybody. For for your time and input. It was a pleasure to, to host, uh, host you and look forward uh, to see you around on the next live uh, edition of uh, Concordia, hopefully in New York, uh, the following sub, uh, session of September. Thank you, have a nice day, stay safe. Thank you, Armin. Thank you so much, Armin, and thank you panelists for that conversation.